Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah. yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, I've been asked to talk about early phase trials and the pediatric DCMC network. Um, and I'd like to start with the slide that everyone always has to show whenever they talk about childhood cancer. Um, and just reflect on what this shows. So this is a great success story. You can see on that slide that the survival for everything has increased. But the problem with this slide is it means that everyone thinks that childhood cancer is done and dusted, sorted. We've done amazing things. The 30 years that are shown on that slide have resulted in huge improvements in survival and everything's perfect. But it's not, is it? If you look at that bottom group of, um, of patients, the ones who are stuck about 60%, They've plateaued, haven't they? They're not still going up, really. They've all just kind of tailed off and they're stuck. And that means for those diagnoses, 40% of those patients are not surviving. And the other thing to say is this improvement in survival over these 30, 40 years has not come through exciting, innovative drugs. This has come through being a bit better at using drugs which have really been around since the year dot. I mean, how many of our patients do we give in crystal? Actinomycin 2, which was developed in the 1950s. So we're still using drugs which have been around for 50 years to get these survival figures. And we're stuck with a group of patients who those are not working for. So if we are going to get better new treatments for childhood cancer, how are we going to do it? So the first problem is, as we all know, childhood cancer is not very common. So there are not thousands of children sitting around ready to be experimented on to develop new drugs, which there are for adult cancers. If you want to develop a new drug for colon cancer, there's thousands of patients just waiting for you to come out and test your new, new agents on. But that's not the case for our patients. The second thing to say is what that slide, everyone interprets that slide as meaning. That we've got conventional agents, they work, we don't need new agents. And that means you get this kind of perception that really new agents are for adults with difficult to treat malignancies and not for children. Children have got chemosensitive tumours. We do really well with those old-fashioned drugs which have been around since the 1950s. We don't need access to these newfangled drugs. And then the other problem is, if you're a drug company and you're going to invest millions of pounds developing a new drug, you need to be able to recoup that money. You're not going to recoup that treating a small group of children who've got Ewing sarcoma or osteosarcoma because there's just not going to be the market for your drug. And it's difficult doing these studies. Small patient numbers means that you've got to collaborate. You've got to collaborate across the whole country, and increasingly you've got to collaborate internationally. So virtually all of our studies over the last 15 years or so have been across Europe. And that's difficult because even with the EU, regulations in one country are not the same as in another. And doing it across the world is even harder. So that makes that it's a lot more difficult to do an early phase study in children than it is to do it in adults with colon cancer, for example. And then there's the problem of travel. So if you, if you have to travel halfway across the country, you are much less likely to do that than if you could just travel five miles down the road. And that's another problem for recruitment. And all of that means that our children are denied innovation. That statement was made in 2004. So that's 14 years ago now. It was made as part of the announcement of the uh, um, EU's programme for forcing drug companies to um, investigate the use of their drugs in children. And it's 14 years has passed, and we're still in the same situation. So, what are we doing to get better at this? So the what I'm going to talk about is the ECMC. So the little bit of history here is that the ECMC was, it was uh, invented, shall we say, in 2007. And it was uh, decided what was going to be would be uh, adult centres who were doing experimental cancer drug work would be allowed to bid for money. So all these adult centres bid. And then at the last moment, the funders said, hang on, what about children? Mm. OK, we give some money to children. So what they did was they gave some money to four centres, the four centres which had the highest recruitment to early phase trials, and that was Manchester, Birmingham, uh, the Marsden, and uh, Leeds, I think. Um, and they didn't ask us what we were going to do with this money. They just said as a sort of afterthought, here's some money. 
So we spent that money on research nurses. And then in 2011, 2010, they said, do you know what would be a really good idea for the next five years, you could actually put in a proper proposal to be a network. So that was what they invited us to do. And so that's what we put in. And then um, they funded that, £238,000 a year. All this money came from NIHR. Um, and that funded 5.4 full-time equivalent research nurses. And this is what that network looked like. So those full-time research nurses were in Manchester, Birmingham, the Marsden, and Newcastle. And then there was less than full-time research nurses in Leeds and Bristol. And then the other centres, Great Ormond Street, Liverpool and Glasgow, they didn't get any money. They were part of the network, but they didn't get anything. <coughs> Glasgow couldn't because the money was all coming from NIHR, which is part of NHS England, and therefore doesn't fund things outside of England. Great Ormond Street at the time said they had loads of money, didn't need any more. They probably regretted that, I think, soon afterwards. And Liverpool, Liverpool at the, at the time was slightly in disgrace, so it, it wasn't considered that Liverpool could, uh, could actually bid for it. So that was what it did look like. So I think you can appreciate that's not really a particularly comprehensive network, and it's not really very much money. But despite that, that network did achieve quite a lot. And over the five years from 2012 to 2017, it had a number of significant achievements. So firstly, we were able to actually establish a proper, robust national trials network. So those centres were able to actually collaborate and talk about where the trials would be placed so that they covered the country, so they weren't all in one centre. They were able to talk about how patients would be referred from one centre to another. And that actually did work in a sensible way. And that resulted in recruitment being improved, really. So over that five-year period, we recruited 152 patients to phase one studies. That's actually quite a lot, if you think about how many children there are with cancer in the UK every year. And we recruited 111 patients to phase two studies. So two, over 260 patients over a five-year period went into either a phase one or a phase two study in the network. The portfolio of trials was much wider than it previously had been. And when we looked at the, the average, because obviously it changes kind of day to day, month to month. On average, we had 20 phase one and two trials open at any one time. And the mean at any centre was five. So every centre had at least one open always. And we had a mean of five. The mean is slightly <coughs> disingenuous because there were a lot of trials open at some centres and <coughs> considerably less at others. And those trials were both solid tumour and leukaemia. The network became increasingly recognised as a functioning network. And that culminated in the ITCC, which is the European Innovative Therapies for Childhood Cancer Consortium, uh, recognising that this was, a, this was a good place. And they audited all of the centres. And um, five of the ECMCs were considered to be doing sufficient work to a high enough standard to be recognised as first in child centres. So places where drugs could be given to children that had never previously been given to adults. And the other thing that happened was that when we started this, pharma was all, let's do it in the US. There was no, let's do it in Europe. Europe got it later, if we were lucky. But by the end of this, actually, pharma was saying, you know what, Europe's quite a good place, and the UK seems to be able to do this. So pharma were actually coming to us, and, and we were opening studies in the UK before they were being opened in the US. And then the other big area was this area of biomarkers and, and pharmacogenomics. So because we had this network, and this network was really good at collecting samples and sending samples off to places, we were actually able to contribute quite a lot to the development of biomarkers and pharmacogenomics. So in neuroblastoma, for instance, the ECMC-funded nurses were really good at collecting bone marrow samples and sending them off, and that was a big contributor to the development of predictive bone marrow predictors of, of good prognosis and bad prognosis. We were able to take part in the import study, looking at blood and urine biomarkers of response. And we also were able to be part of this magic collaboration, which comes from Liverpool, which is looking at how you predict who's <coughs> going to get toxicity from chemotherapy. So they were looking particularly at which patients would get hearing problems from cisplatin, and then subsequently which, problems would, which patients would get kidney problems from cisplatin. So that was all possible because of the network. Pharmacology was already a big strength of the UK, 
and we had the um, Newcastle Paediatric Pharmacology Centre, which had recruited over the years a lot of patients to studies. And these patients were disseminated across the whole country. But after we had the network, there was a 50% increase in the, in the numbers that we recruited because our ECMC funded nurses were really good at not just doing it themselves, but encouraging other people to do it. And the four highest recruiting centres in 2015 were all part of the network. And this isn't just about collecting numbers. This actually has an impact on patients. So because the, the samples were there, Newcastle were able to do their work. And a good example is the 13-cis retinoic acid work, where they showed <coughs> that dose-reducing 13-cis retinoic acid in infants resulted in a lower level of exposure. And therefore, that recommendation was, was taken out, and infants now get the same dose as older children. And the other big area was functional imaging. So this is the idea of doing scans that are more than just a CT or an MR. The scans which look at functional properties of the tumour, like blood flow and uh, the cellular density. And this, there is a functional imaging, imaging network for the whole country, um, <coughs> which recruited a lot of patients. But again, like the pharmacology network, there was a big increase in recruitment to patients after the EC ECMC network was established. And this really resulted in functional imaging becoming much more mainstream. So now, if your child has a, has a brain tumour and they have an MR scan, they don't just get a standard MR scan, they get a diffusion-weighted scan, they probably get spectroscopy. And 10 years ago, that didn't happen. So that's been a big change over the last few years. And the other thing that we've been able to do is actually get more functional imaging into trials. So Beacon, the European Phase two study for relapsed neuroblastoma, is a good example. So that has functional imaging embedded in it to see whether these kind of properties of tumours are things that are useful to, to look at. And no one's previously done that in neuroblastoma. So just to summarise what that network achieved, really, over those five years, there was a transformation. We went from struggling to do early phase trials to actually being able to deliver early phase trials. And those trials, importantly, were not just, it wasn't just a, a total number increase, it was that we were able to spread them around the country more. And that meant that the opportunity for children to go into an early phase trial was, had never been greater. And I'm not for the moment suggesting that all children should go into an early phase trial, but I think that all children should be offered the opportunity. We were able to demonstrate that we could conduct these trials efficiently, and that's very important when it comes to being a place where pharma would like to pay, place their trial. They want to know that we're not going to muck about, we're going to recruit patients and we're going to get the answer that they, well, not necessarily the answer they want, but the answer in a, in a sensible time frame. And our nurses didn't just collect the samples, they actually were advocates for other people doing it. So they would go to other places and they would say, really, you need to do, be doing more. And there's something a bit competitive about this. If your centre is doing badly, you don't want to be shown up as being the one who's not contributing. So there's a bit of kind of, come on, let's all be better. And the samples that we collected were really important, not just for those kind of translational things like pharmacology, but also for basic science. You know, people forget that you can't do basic science if you haven't got the sample from the patient. So all of those samples, two or three steps back from the clinic, actually are contributing to things which are really important in the future. And the network was able to be really good at fostering the movement of things from the lab to the clinic, translating stuff into clinical use. A good example would be BCT100. So this is a trial which is now in setup. So this comes from Birmingham where Frank Nassai's laboratory um, demonstrated that if you deprive tumour cells of arginine, which is an, an amino acid, they die. And normal cells don't because they can make it. But tumour cells can't make it. And so they were able to take that observation from the lab and actually translate that into a clinical trial which will very shortly be open, where we'll be depriving patients of arginine to see if it has the same effect on their tumour cells as it does in the lab. The network had a very close relationship with the, the clinical trials unit in Birmingham, and this was important because um, we were able really to move from doing clinical trials in a kind of a bit of a wing and a prayer to doing it in a properly <coughs> funded, sensible way. So now, when a clinical trial comes along, there's an application for funding to get the, the resource that's needed to run it properly. 
And the relationship with ITCC has been very important. So it's ITCC is able to recognise that ECMC is a functioning network and is very happy that our centres are able to conduct trials in a robust way. And the other thing that's also important is that we were, we've been able to increasingly engage with pharmaceutical companies. So in the past, they would come and they'd say, this is our trial, this is how it's going to be, do you want to do it? Whereas now, they come to us and they say, we're thinking about doing this trial, how should we do it? And that's a big change, because it means that we get trials which actually we can influence and answer questions that are important for us rather than the ones, ones which are important for them. And we've been able to have these pan-European trials with functional imaging, which is a, a big departure. So that's what it did achieve. So then, the next five years. So what we wanted to do in the next five years, which we're already a year into now, is to be better at this. So I've shown you that we've done really well, but I think we can be better still. I think we can make it so that we have really good availability of new drugs for children with cancer in this country. So we wanted to expand our network. So it was nine centres in the previous one. We wanted 11. We wanted to include Cambridge, partly because it's Cambridge and it looks good on the application, but really because it's got a lot of expertise in preclinical medicine. And we wanted that expertise as part of our, our bid. And the other place we wanted was Southampton. Southampton is a really big centre for immunotherapy in adults. So it's got loads of immunotherapy expertise that we need for children. So we want that in our network. And we wanted a big increase in money. We wanted money so we could have a nurse at every site. We had 5.4 before. We wanted 11. I'm greedy. And I wanted an administrator because 11 centres... That needs someone to organise it. So we wanted an administrator. And we wanted that administrator at the Comprehensive Research Network Centre in Leeds because that was a politically good place for them to be. And the whole point of this was so that we had an infrastructure which would allow us to implement what's coming down the line, which is precision medicine for children. So the first bit of that is the stra stratified medicine for paediatrics, but then there will be bits that follow on from that. And you can't do that. You can't, you can't take tumour material from a child get robust data and then tailor the treatment to that child unless you've got some infrastructure to do it. And we wanted there to be more support for this preclinical research and translation research. We want to be better at getting stuff from the lab into the clinic more quickly so that novel findings can be tested against children as soon as possible rather than 10 years down the line. And so the way we did this was we had seven themes. And all of those themes, basically what I did was I got people who I thought would look best on the application and made them theme leads, because that made the application look much better to have all of Richard Gilbertson's publications on it. And they liked that. So what did they do? The best thing here was they said, yeah, fine, you can expand to 11 centres. So that was good. And they gave us loads more money. So the real sea change here was CIUK now are funding it. CIUK weren't funding it before, it was all NIHR. So now it's CIUK and, an, and NIHR, so we get double the money. And that means also that Scotland can be part of it and get money. So the Chief Scientist's Office in Glasgow has given us money as what, for, for, has given money for Glasgow. So we've got, we didn't get everything we wanted. We've got full-time research nurses in those centres. So six centres have got a full-time research nurse. Uh, Bristol's got almost a full-time research nurse. And the rest have got um, 0.6. But every centre's got something. They also gave us an administrator, not in the CRN, but actually at the ECMC programme office. And then they also came back to us and said, do you know, I think you need a data manager as well. So we said, yeah, OK, that's a good idea. We'll have a data manager in Birmingham. And they agreed to the seven scientific themes and said those were all a good idea. So what were the aims that we were going to take forward for the next five years? More new treatments for more children with cancer. That's the fundamental point of this. We don't want to be using drugs that have been around since the year dot. We want to have drugs that are better, more efficient, and we want to be able to treat those resistant patients. We want equity of opportunity. It shouldn't matter that you live in Wimbledon or you live in Inverness. It shouldn't be that just because you happen to be able to afford to live in Wimbledon, you can go to the Marsden and get access to the world, and because you live in rural Scotland, you can't get anything. That's wrong. 
And that means you need to have more trials open across the network. So those figures where I say, well, the mean's five, disingenuous because half of those trials are open at the Marsden and not across the network. And that's, that's not how it has to be. It should be across the network. The problem is you need a sort of critical mass of patients. You can't justify opening a trial in the centre if you're not going to recruit anyone. <coughs> and so what we're doing to, to deal with that is organise our centres into four networks. So we're breaking the country up into these four regional networks. There's a picture of them in a minute. And the idea is there that each of those will contain one of these first and child centres approved by ITCC and it will contain some non-first and child ECMC but it will also contain some other principal treatment centres. So everyone in that network will be linked together. And our default position for the next five years, if someone wants to open a trial in the network, is you open it in each of those regional bits. So it's open across the whole country. And what we hope that this network, which is really joined up, it's really organised, it's planned out, will mean that we become an a more and more attractive place for industry to do its trials. So they come to us first of all. And it is, it's a coordinated and cooperative network and it's going to become more so through these regional um, uh, subdivisions. And fundamentally, what this network needs to be really good at is being able to identify these smaller and smaller groups of patients. So the future is going to be, it's not just the patient's got leukaemia, that the patient's got leukaemia with this particular <coughs> molecular abnormality and therefore it needs this particular type of treatment. That's the way we're going. It's not going to be one size fits all. And that's a challenge because the groups of patients get smaller and smaller. So this is the new net these are the new networks. So the north one, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Newcastle. Newcastle is honorary part of Scotland. Um, the sensible bit of the country, the north northwest, and the M62 corridor. The Midlands, Wales, and the South West get all lumped together, and then London and the South East. So those are the networks. Each of those has got a first, uh, first and child centre, it's got non first and child ECMC, and it's got principal treatment centres as well. And those networks are up and running. So these are the themes. So the first theme is about the implementing of precision medicine, being the infrastructure so that we can, um, produce, we can get molecular screening information and use that to tailor the patient's treatment. Um, so to do this we have to have coordinated collection of biological material, the testing has to be rapid um, and this allows us really to be a partner in the, in the, the innovations which are already here like eSmart which is a European um, trial where you put the patient into a particular subtype of, of the trial based on what molecular abnormalities they have but also we can take leading roles in future initiatives across Europe, Brexit allowing. Being better at enhancing the portfolio, so it's very important that we have better trial designs because the numbers are going to be smaller and smaller, so we need innovative designs and we've worked working with CRCTU to do that. Improving the interactions with all the different sources of drugs, so some <coughs> of the drugs are coming from Cancer Research UK, some from the Combinations Alliance, some from industry. We want to be better at reviewing proposals rapidly, giving good feedback as to whether this is something that's a goer or whether it needs to be modified in some way. Continue the close interaction with ITCC, which has been very useful, and basically be a better, um, a, a better known trial network. So people, when they think of trials, they think ECMC. The translation, so getting stuff from the clinic to the lab more quickly. So what we really want to have here is a kind of a, a virtual centre for the whole country. We want to be able to use all of the expertise of everyone doing childhood cancer research across the whole of the UK and bring that to bear on a proposal. So we don't want the situation where a small group of people do not have the expertise and therefore it gets thrown out of the window because they don't know enough about it. We want to be able to say, here's the proposal, there's the expert, what do they think? Is that a goer? And if it's not a goer, how does it need to be changed to be, to be a goer? And then once we do it, we need to feed back what happened, what went well, what didn't go well, to the people that know about it, so that they can say, okay, well, it didn't work because of this. And then you can change it and do it again. So that whole process of doing things seamlessly and rapidly to get things from the lab to the patient as quickly as possible. 
immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is, is the big thing. Even in adults, immunotherapy is, is the way of the future. So we're already doing chimeric antigen receptor trials. We want to do more of those. So more of those for more different types of tumour. We want to make better cars so we can treat different types of tumour. We want to be better at monitoring the response of the patient. We want to be better at combining existing types of, anti of uh, immunotherapy, like GB2 antibody, with novel types of therapies like checkpoint inhibitors. We want it to be basically moving from where we are to having a big portfolio of immunotherapy trials. Pharmacology, so pharmacology is well an area that we're really good at already, but we can be better. We can be better at working out what's the genetic variability which underpins toxicity of treatment. So why does that patient get vincristin neuropathy and that patient not, even though they've had the same dose of the same drug? We can be better at maximising the therapeutic benefit for the individual. So rather than just giving that dose, we give that dose, then we check what levels we've achieved in the patient and we alter the dose on subsequent days to give the, the best exposure. And really, real-time adaptive dosing, so that's basically doing that. It's saying we'll give the dose over three days, measure the level after the first, and then change the dose on the third day. That's something we could do. We do that already for some patients. For, for babies, for example, we do that with carb platting. And there's no reason really with enough infrastructure why we couldn't do that for a lot more patients. Advanced imaging. So we need to have more of our ECMCs as part of the advanced imaging network. What we need is to have more advanced imaging applied to non-brain tumours, so other types of, of solid tumour elsewhere in the body. We need to have more advanced imaging in our clinical trials. So really all of our new trials should be having an advanced imaging question. And we want to be able to introduce new technologies, and that requires collaboration. It works really well at the moment, but something comes in and there's a Europe-wide collaborative, is this something we want to do, how are we going to do it, what are the standards we need to adhere to, and we need to continue to do that. And then biobanking. So biobanking is something that is really, really important, because if we do not have tissue, we don't have the ability to answer basic science questions. So we need to get more patients biobanked, and not just at diagnosis, but also at relapse, because if you look, patient samples are quite different sometimes at relapse to how they were at diagnosis. We need the, the biobank to perhaps be a little bit uh, a little bit stronger to have more annotation with the samples so that when, patient, when people come to use the samples they are more useful. And we need to look at other types of tissue. So can we store plasma? Can we store CSF? Can we store things that at the moment we do not store because we just store tissue? And we need to make sure that the biobank feeds into the stratified medicine and uh, allows real-time reporting which can inform how the patient is treated. <coughs> so, those were the scientific themes, the progress that we've made. So we appointed a network manager, Shona Scales, who's there, who's going to tell you about CRUK and what it does for childhood cancer later on. And that's great. And we have a paediatric strategy group, which is also good. It looks like that. It's got a chair who is not a paediatric oncologist, is an adult oncologist, and they're supposed to be independent, impartial, supportive, and challenging, which they are. We have a vice chair who is a paediatric oncologist, and then we have me as the lead, and then we have the centre leads, we have the theme leads, we have Shona, we have parental representation, and that strategy group meets on a regular basis. The trials database, so this is a, an ECMC across the whole ECMC initiative. This has been, we've, we've been able to uh, be involved in this. So this is basically a searchable database so a clinician can look and see what trials are open across the UK for their child. And it works, it's really nice. And it's actually, it's, update, it's going to be updated monthly so it will be quite useful. So as a parent, you can go and speak to your treating clinician and they can look at this database, or they will be able to look at this database and find out all the trials that would, that would fit for your child. The relapse regional, the, the regional um, networks have been created and the, what we've got is what we call um, discussion panels. So in each of those networks we have a virtual meeting where each of the centres 
put someone up and we talk about patients who've relapsed. Now sometimes the discussion is, well, this is a patient who's got leukemia and they've relapsed and they're having standard leukemia relapse treatment or they've got some urolastoma patient and they've gone into beaking. But we also have the discussions about, well, they've had this, they've had that, they've had what, what else can they have? So, and it's working. We're actually discussing all of the patients who've relapsed and we're having that discussion about what trials would be suitable for them, and where are those trials open, and we're referring patients around. And it's, it's so much better now than it was a few years ago with this discussion. Um, and it's a, it's a big step to having an equitative opportunity because now we're, we're talking about <coughs> what's available. And because we're talking about what's available, we're aware what, what the sort of inequality of distribution. We're also trying to make sure the tissue is sent, so the patient's relapse, having taken a biopsy, having sent it for sequencing. And sometimes early phase trials are not appropriate. But the really important thing is that we record what. So we say the patient should go to you, Birmingham for lenvatinib, and then three weeks later, did the patient go to Birmingham for lenvatinib? Why not? And that's really important because if we know why people don't go, that allows us to get better at working out what the barriers are to participation. The other thing we've worked really hard on is getting our network recognised. So, particularly recognised within Europe as a network that's, in, that's a very <coughs> significant player in treating childhood cancer. And a very other very important step is that we have now got agreements across our network that we'll have one single point. So any drug, any trial that comes in goes to one point and then is vetted and then we have a coordinated um, view of where that trial should be and um, where it should be placed across the UK. And that's really, really important. And this is the last thing I want to say is that there are not many children with cancer and most of those children are cured. So the proportion of children that come to an early phase trial is very small and it's a very, very valuable resource. And the only way to develop new treatments is for as many of those children as possible to take part in early phase clinical trials. And that means there is no point in us open clinical trials where they're in direct competition. And therefore it takes three times as long to finish the clinical trials it should because there are two of them out competing with each other. And that's why this has to be coordinated. We have to be able to make sure that the valuable resource which is gonna help us get better in the future being used in the best possible way.